Hey gang, woodblock printing is one of the oldest art forms and it's still being practiced today. Buckle in because I've got a wonderful interview with master carver and printer Alex Carmona where he shares what it takes to create in this unique art form as well as some great tips on how to run your art business. Hi, my name is James Owens, and on this channel, I share with you the techniques, tips, hacks, and history that I've learned over 35 years to help you become a better artist. Now, through those 35 years, I've had the opportunity to know and work with some of the most talented people on the face of the earth. And one of those people is my good friend, Alex Carmona, master woodcarver and printer, who, in this interview, shares with you his techniques for working in this unique art form, as well as some wonderful tips on what it takes to be an artist and how to run your art business. So let's dive in. All right. Well, good morning, Alex. Thank you for joining me today. Um, from uh, where are you? Peoria, Illinois? Yep. Peoria, Illinois. Central Illinois. Right on. And you recently moved there, right? Yeah, I guess it's been, I don't know, a little over two years now that we've Holy lived here. smokes at time flies. It's like you were unloading the moving van yesterday. <laughs> it was, right? I, I, time just flies by, man. Like your whole freaking life, right? Right. My dad told me when I was graduating high school, he said, now you're, you, you're, your life is going to go faster and faster and faster. And man, he wasn't kidding. I, you know, I, I do feel like I was 19 yesterday. Dude, I remember adults telling me that when I was like in middle school and remembering like how how I thought like, ah, this person's crazy. I can't wait to get my, uh, my driver's license and go to high school and this and that. And now I'm like, what the hell? What happened all the time? It's like, yeah. Oh. And, and why was I in such a hurry? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, tell, tell, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you, um, have you been an artist your whole life? Yeah, I guess I've been pretty obsessive about art since I was a kid. Um, it's funny because, you know, you go to like introductions at art classes and people like introduce themselves and everybody likes to say, oh, I've been, I, I've, I've drawn since I was, since I could pick up a pencil or this and that, you know, um, that's actually, I'm not going to say that's my story, but it's cool because my, um, one of my oldest memories is going to, on a family vacation with, uh, uh, with all my family to Cancun and, there's a picture of me in the hotel room and I was like, what, maybe, maybe I was six or seven. I don't know. Uh, there's a picture of me in the hotel room uh, by myself. My mom had bought me this little miniature, uh, like a model of a sailboat, you know? And I was in there drawing the sailboat while everybody was outside on the beach, you know? And like, I, and that's kind of like, how my whole life has been. I've, I've, I spent a lot of time when I was young alone because my parents or actually my grandparents, they raised me. So I call them mom and dad. Uh, they worked a lot. You know, I did have an older sister, but uh, um, I spent a lot of time by myself in my room, just drawing, building models, you know, stuff like that. You know, that seems to be kind of a through thread with a lot of creative people that I know. We've spent a lot, we spent a lot of time with ourselves as children, uh, entertaining ourselves with drawing or painting or building things. It seems to be the creative mindset, you know? I, I heard a story about, um, actually I knew a guy who had gone to school with the great Sid Mead. Uh, he was the uh, visual futurist on Blade Runner and tons of movies and, you know, just incredible artist. And he said when they were in art school, you know, they're young and they're, you know, hanging out and they all go to go out to the bar or something from the school and they pass Sid Mead sitting on the stoop or on the curb drawing reflections that he saw in the bumper of a car. And they're mm -hmm. like, Hey, you want to go to the bar? And he was like, nah, I got work to do, but look where it took him. I mean, to the top of his industry, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I guess when you think about it, I mean, all that is, is practice. Right. And the, the more you practice anything in life, I talk to people about this stuff all the time because, you know, me and you as artists, uh, we hear the same thing over and over. Like it, it was like God given gift. You're so talented, this and that. And 
Uh, I don't totally agree with that because you try doing anything for, you know, 30 plus years and try not being good at it, you know? Right. Uh, I was just that obsessed with, with art, with building things, uh, just, just with anything creative. Yeah. You know, I, I honestly believe that any, I tell people all the time, anything you spend all day doing for years, you're going to get good at, you know, yeah. and if you went back and, and could meet us when we were 15 years old, well, we weren't maybe that much better than any of the other 15 year olds we were in school with. We might've been more interested in it than they are, but, it, and that's what kept us practicing, but it's really, you know, I mean, that's a deep philosophical question you and I could get into is what is talent? And you and I have personally talked about this before, you know, and I, it, I think it was Thomas Edison or somebody said like, talent is only 10% of it. The other 90% is showing up. <laughs> yeah, I think so, man. And um, I think people, you know, I feel, I feel about it like, uh, it's almost kind of discounts the amount of work that we've put into what we do. Yeah. But I also don't believe it's something that people really think about before they say it. So it's not like I'm mad at anybody for thinking that, right? No, no. I think if somebody says, oh, you're so talented, they are definitely trying to offer you a compliment. And there's no reason at all to be, take it as something disparaging, you know, even though, you know, when you start digging into the, philosophical aspects of talent it really is not it, it's something that's that's developed and worked at it's not something that's magically bestowed on people I think the best the people that are best at whatever it is they do they make it look like it was magic right there's a lot of there's a lot of practice behind closed doors you know yeah and, nobody sees any of that stuff right they don't see the um the work that we threw away <laughs> <laughs> right. And you got to be willing to do that. It literally do stuff, you know, people are never going to see, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, what, uh, what drew you to uh, woodblock printing? I, I know, well, first of all, let me back up just a little bit. Now, I know you spent a little bit of your youth in the military, so you weren't completely devoted to doing art at that time, correct? Yeah. So straight out of high school, I went to, actually went to college for a couple years or a year and a half or whatever the hell it was. And um, right around that time I joined the military. And uh, when I got back from tech school and all that, I, uh, the nice thing about the military is they'll pay for your education. So I continued going to college, but I had changed my major from a, uh, from a business major to uh, visual arts. And I had initially chosen a business major because I was told my whole life that I couldn't, uh, that art wasn't really a profession, that type of thing that I think we all kind of go through as artists. Uh, and I believed it forever. So I went to school for business. After the first semester in business school, I, I was like, screw it. I'm not doing this. This is not me. And I don't care if I'm broke. <laughs> I'm going to go get an art degree, you know? Yeah. So I joined the art program there at the school I went to. And um, while I was there, uh, I had already, you know, I had, I had taken all my basic art classes and then it was time for me to pick, uh, you know, a, um, what do you call it? Like an emphasis or whatever, right? Well, around that time too, uh, my, my advisor had, had recommended for me to take, or no, he didn't recommend it actually. He, he was one of those situations where he's like, oh, all right, well, you need one more class, uh, an elective art class. Uh, why don't you try either pottery or printmaking? You haven't taken either one of those. And I was like, well, I don't, nothing against pottery, but it's not me. I didn't, I've done pottery. I don't, not, I'm not, it's not for me. So I was like, well, I'll try this printmaking thing out and see what that's about. I had no idea what it was before that. Um, and it's funny because talking to, talking to people, uh, older people, they, they say that they kind of learned it in high school, you know, so they kind of know the art that way. And it took me going to college to learn what the heck it even was, which is pretty, pretty interesting. I think that's because they're just not teaching this stuff in high school art classes any longer. 
Yeah, is it I considered an outdated art form because it is kind of a old style of art form. It is, but I think a lot of factors go into it now that I'm older and my kids are in school. Um, I, I think that if you don't have a, an art teacher who's like passionate about kind of giving you a versatile set of skills and maybe opening, uh, opening you up to new things, um, it's probably more based on that. And on top of that, you know, when you're doing printmaking, you you have to deal with sharp tools. Uh, I don't know how much of a liability that adds to a school if they if they do right. something. Like that. So and when we know, were in school, that wouldn't have been nearly as big a deal. Yeah, you'd get slapped around with rulers and stuff, right, Jim? <laughs> Man, I was I was like using pots of molten uh, brass making jewelry and stuff in high school. Oh, that's man. Could you and that, and, and it's really sad because. Things like art and uh, even things like wood shop. I mean, they're they're not they're not seen as important anymore in school, and it's 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 really concerning because um, it's not good for kids who you know who who don't really belong in 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 any area of school. They're creative, you know. Yeah, I mean, they're better with their hands than than maybe other things yeah it's good to learn basic of course you know life skills math all that other stuff reading and that has to be done uh but actually something just happened recently which was kind of you know brought up a lot of memories which was my daughter was in um i think language arts class and the teacher uh picked up the student's picture and and he got in trouble because he was drawing on his free time and she said something like, uh, she, li she lifted it up, showed it to the class and said something like, this kids will never get you a job. This is not a job, this is a hobby. And she told him to read or get back to whatever the heck he was supposed to be doing. And um, my, my daughter uh, said nothing because we're, we're kind of like, you know, have your own opinions about things, whatever. But when she told me about it, I was like, man, that's, that's the problem with, with our, our public education system is they're they're trying to to push you into uh social norms and not really um giving the kids a chance to explore their actual passions and hone in those skills and maybe teach them like hey th this is a viable option if you work real hard you know it's not going to be the road but it's uh, almost it's almost as if they didn't even look at the pants they put on the coffee cup they picked up this morning. The, Everything. the arts are, com you're surrounded by the arts. Who designed your house? I mean, who designed your car? It's, it's so <laughs> silly. Somebody designed it. The TV, the style of the TV, the, I mean, everything right. in your house, somebody, an artist designed it. Right. Designed it. Right. And people don't think about that. I mean, it's everywhere where you look, you look outside the window. If you see any sort of structure, it's there, you know? Anything you bought and put on a shelf in your home or sat on or put on your body, it was all designed by someone creative, <laughs> you know? So after you were in the military and then you, you, you also did some college, when did you start pursuing art as something you saw as a full-time vocation? So I actually... I. I was in the military for 10 years. And um, while I was there, it, it was a great job and I'm, I'm glad I did it. Uh, but the, the, the specific job that I had to do, um, there, there wasn't a whole lot of um, fulfillment that I got out of it. And even though it paid really well, and there was my life. Yeah. Can you hear that? Yeah, sizzling. Anyway, all right. Sorry, you're gonna have to deal with it. That's right. Um, so while I was in there, I, I, I realized that um, it wasn't good for me. It what it wasn't good for my soul, and it was it was doing not like it was really making me depressed. Having to go there every day uh, just for a paycheck, and it was kind of like the same story I told you earlier about you know, going to business school and uh, 
and then just changing my mind about my degree and not caring what the hell happened. And it was the same exact situation when I was in the, in the military. So while I was in, luckily I had a really awesome supervisor who was really lenient with me. And when I had a, a show that I had to do on the weekend and if I had to work, he'd let me make it up. And um, I also, another thing to add to that, I worked four 10 hour shifts. So I had, you know, three days off to, uh, to do artwork. So for a long time, uh, while I was in the military, I really had two full-time jobs. I had the full-time job in the military and then I created my website and started getting back into artwork pretty hardcore again and started producing work. And um, I kind of did it all in steps when I got out of the military. I was actually able to get a part-time position there, which is pretty cool. That was only 20 hours a week, right? And benefits and all that, same pay. And um, after that, I just, uh, I left. I, I, I took off and it was that 10 year mark where in the military, you need 20 years to retire. And if you stay in any longer than 10, it's, it's really, it, it, and, and you're planning to get out at any point, it's really not to your benefit because then you might as well just stay in a little bit longer to uh, get your, your retirement, right? So it was an easy decision for me though, because like I said, it was just killing my soul to be there every day because I, I had nothing it, to fulfill like my inner desire to uh, be productive or to create things. Right. Which tells me, obviously, you know, I believe, I believe people are created with a purpose and that's your purpose is to create things. Right. Yeah, yeah I, I think so, man. Um, you know, some people are very athletic and do really well in sports and that, or some people with, with music or whatever it is. And mine, I knew it my whole life, uh, but I didn't really believe it. I didn't really believe in myself enough to, to just go for it when I was young. And that's a huge thing, isn't it? Believing in yourself. Oh man. It's, it's really been interesting being an artist full time and then having your own business uh, because really you're in, the goal is to make money, to sell your artwork, right? And to get your artwork out there. Wait a minute. Isn't that selling out? <laughs> yeah, to some. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to pay your light bill and put food on your table. You're selling uh, out. And look, I got a family, right? Uh, and I actually left the military when I had kids, you yeah. know? So, uh, babies. I, yeah, I knew that I had to do right by my family and I had responsibilities, so... Failure was never an option for me. Right. So I, I realized that um, the confidence was such a big thing because, you know, as an artist, when you first go out, there's no handbook. There, there's nothing you can really even read or, or listen to that kind of tells you things you should think about like that because I've realized that a lot of artists don't value themselves or don't think of themselves too highly, which is a good thing to be humble. But, um, you know, when you're, when you're, when you devalue your own work and don't ask much money for it, then people will perceive that value as to what it is. Uh, whether you're a, an amazing painter or whatever you do, if you have a real cheap price tag on your painting, some people that'll actually, uh, that'll, Turn some people off. Keep them from buying your piece because then they are going to devalue it because you're doing the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. In, you know, talking about having confidence in yourself and stuff, uh, it reminds me of your early morning talks that you've been posting. Tell me, tell me about those early morning talks. I mean, 4.30, dude, that's pretty stoic of you. <laughs> well... I've been getting up at 4.30 for, seems like forever. I'm just, I'm pretty used to it. And I'm afraid you go to bed. I usually go to bed around 10.30, 10, 10.30, 11 at the latest. If I go to, I know I can't go to sleep later than 11 or I'll be hurting in the morning, you know? Right. So, uh, <laughs> so um, I've been, I've been recently this year and it wasn't like a, um, it wasn't something I planned out or anything like that for my new year's resolution or, anything like that. But, um, you know, 
I talk to a lot of people and people send me a lot of emails and people ask me for advice all the time. And really what I'm trying to do is, uh, is just help people out and remind them that, uh, you know, very basic things to, to think about uh, to start your day off. A lot of them being basically centered around discipline because you know, the, the more disciplined you can become, the easier things seem to be. Uh, you can cope with things better. Um, you can get through things a lot easier. It's, uh, you can get, I mean, the benefits are, they're exponential once you, once, you, once you actually put it into action. So every morning I get up at four o'clock, I'm downstairs by 4.30 and I just, you know, I've had to, I've had to learn to become a little bit more comfortable in front of the camera, which uh, if you've seen any of my er earlier videos, you would know it is getting a little bit better. <laughs> Because I, I look at some of those videos and I'm like, oh, what the hell were you saying, dude? <laughs> Welcome uh, to my video. I would like to invite you in. <laughs> so, so I'm down here by 4.30. And um, one of the things, so I, I, I just talk about regular stuff, right? Uh, you know, uh, persistence. If you have a goal, follow through. It's just all very, none of it's new information. It's just, I think, things that a lot of people forget about, and me included. Uh, I, I'm lucky enough that I can listen to podcasts all day long while I create my artwork that, or an audio book uh, that will help me help reinforce those thoughts. Um, and I think people need that. And it's been really cool because, uh, you know, whenever you do anything like that, you're, uh, you're very vulnerable, you know? You, you're, op you're opening yourself up to criticism and all that other stuff that comes with it. And I knew that going in, but I didn't really care because having conversations face-to-face -face with people and online, I, I, I got the sense that people were receptive to what I was telling them as if it was like something new and exciting for them. So I think I the world needs positive messages. We're, we're bombarded constantly with the negative. And Man. people, especially people trying to become an artist or build a business of some sort, we do need that constant reinforcement. That is the truth. That man, you. The, the problem I have with society these days is that that exact thing. Um, I think more attention needs to be paid to positive, positive things. Learning how to how to create positivity, and, and it's contagious. You know. Yeah. And, if you're positive to, to a person, they are more than likely going to reciprocate. Um, and, you know, another reason why I started doing it too is because it, it really, um, it, it really just, it helps reinforce my own uh, discipline, knowing that people are counting on me to give them a little message in the morning. And, it's been really cool because people, since I started doing that, I get messages every single day, like a lot of them. Sometimes it takes me a while to get back to people. I try to respond to everybody, but just people telling me things like, thank you so much. You know, I, 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 I've dealt with depression here and there or a lot. And your videos are really helping motivate me uh, to, to do better for myself and to, and to do what I love. I get messages like that all day long and it's really, it makes me happy that I could provide some sort of help for people in that reminder. Yeah. I, I really dig them. And you know, I, I do, I listen to them quite often. I probably, most of them that you put up, I listen to them because well, you and I have talked many times in the past and I think you're a wise person and I like the advice that you offer in those things because mm -hmm. Most of the time, I think we are our own worst enemies and we get in our own way. You know, we may have a dream to do something like maybe you're a young artist or new at it and you have a dream of, you know, taking your art around the world or becoming influential or, or you know, even admired by others because we all have an ego and let's face it, when we're children and we draw good and somebody says that looks wonderful, well, it strokes our ego, but whatever it is, 
we all need that encouragement to get out of our own way. Yeah, big time. Um, it's that's kind of been the story of my me growing up and 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 figuring out who I really am uh, because you know I I was that person you know I was that person who stopped myself who held my myself back I didn't allow myself to succeed for the longest time because I was so scared of failure and I think you, we all do that oh of, of course it's a human it's a it's a very human trait yeah um, you know uh, we we it's like a, it's like a mechanism for, um, for longevity, right. Uh, to, to, to save you from harm. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to raise my kids in a way to, so they can not be afraid to take risks and be it calculated risks, uh, but teaching them how that works and how to be confident because it all goes hand in hand with each other. Yeah. And, and don't make decisions based on fear. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, take into account the risks, but, you know, don't let fear be the overriding factor on, on a decision. Yeah. And it's, man, fear, fear kind of manipulated my, my upbringing, you know, and I think it does to a lot of people. Sure. Uh, you know, my, my parents, my grandparents, they worked very hard. They came from nothing. And, uh, it, it really, it was really hard when I had the conversation with them that I was leaving my, my government job and with all the good benefits because to them, um, they worked so hard for me to have that security uh, security and not have to live the life that they lived. And, um, you know, that, that's just, that, that's one of these things that I, I think that our, our society needs to go back to is, um, fo following your passions, pursuing what you believe in and not, like I said earlier, not, not thinking that you have to fall into these social norms because whoever on TV says so, you know, or because your parents even say so, because we're all different. We're all individuals and we all have our own, uh, wants, needs, desires, you know, um, we, we can't all fall into the same category. Right. Right. Hey, let me, let me shift gears a little bit here. And, uh, cause I, I, you know, the main reason I wanted to have you on was to talk about this very interesting and I don't know, it feels a little rare to me cause I know so few artists that are working in your medium. I want to talk about woodblock printing a little bit. Okay. Um, I could talk philosophy and politics and religion and all this stuff with you all day long, but we'll do that in a private call. Right. <laughs> um, so tell me a little bit about wood block printing, kind of what maybe a little bit of its history. When was its golden era of, of its main use? You know, talk to me like I'm a five-year-old. Let me know. Cause I honestly, I don't know that much about it. Well, to be honest with you, I don't know the complete history about it. I know that it is super old uh, it dates back to, I think, like 220 AD. And they originally used it, I believe, to print patterns on textiles or some, something like that. Uh, and then eventually they started using it more as an art form for uh, reproducing uh, fine art. Uh, they, they used it to reproduce things like publications, right? That was like the earliest form of a... Uh, newspaper or whatever or you know well, like, like before metal type and metal engraving right, but... right or like um you know old wanted posters where somebody would etch out somebody's face says wanted you know all that other stuff so it has a really long history and you know me picking printmaking because i love illustrating i i i I've, I've had pencil in hand my whole life i just love drawing and when I first started my business, I was like a jack of all trades artist. Like, oh, you need a mural? I'll do it. You need a painting? I'll do it. Illustration? I'll do it. All that stuff, right? Printmaking. Well, I finally realized one day, if I want to really get good at any of these, I have to just stick to one. 
Yeah. Uh, I can't just be mediocre or, or decent at all of them. I really wanted to make an impact on my career and on the art world. So when it came down to that decision, it was a calculated move. I love printmaking, but I also have a lot of other, a lot of other, other interests in, uh, in art, right? What I realized with printmaking was when I'd show it to people at a, at a car show or an art show or whatever, people were asking me if I had invented the technique. Like nobody knew what the heck it was, you know, because it's so uncommon. Uh, and and that, that led me to my decision like, hey, this is like an easy wow factor right here. Because if you can be a little bit different as an artist when you're trying to sell your art and you have other artists next to you trying to sell their art, man, if you can be a little different and if you can be good at what you do, of course, it goes such a long way because everybody's seen uh, the, you know, the, what we see every day, the, the, um, paintings, drawings, uh, sculptures, and not to discount any of those things. Cause I'm a big fan of all of them. Uh, it, it was just for me an easy decision because of the way people, uh, reacted to it. Right. So that, that business entrepreneurial part of you was kicking in even at an early stage where you strategically chose a medium that you knew was interesting and not that well known. Exactly. And it was really, it was a calculated decision because this is a business and my plan is to provide my family, you know, provide for my right. family. Well, uh, who, who, okay. Um, I don't mean to interrupt because I brought you on here to hear you talk, but <laughs> let me hear me talk. Um, <laughs> so who, Oh, oh, are, are there woodblock artists that like really move you and you were like, that's, you know, who, who are your influences that really move you emotionally when you look at their art? And okay, let's open it up. It doesn't have to be just a woodblock printer. Who, who are your influences and in, that move you? So um, growing up, like I said, I've, all, I've always been like a, an illustrator, right? And one of the things I always wanted to, my goal uh, was always to just get to that photorealistic uh, skill level, right? And for that reason, I think, uh, and because I pay such close attention to detail, I am so, uh, I'm just so blown away by engravers, like the ones you see on dollar bills. Those master engravers that, that create currency uh, and I couldn't tell you any of their names, to be honest, <laughs> but they all just move me so much because of the way they create values with their line work, tonal values. Yeah. So uh, I, that and stock cer certificates, which I recently uh, have been really looking into a lot. Uh, they, they have these beautiful vignettes of, you know, of industry or of the CEO just awesome engravings uh, to make the stock certificate look really beautiful. Are those uh, old? Is there, are there people still working in that way or are they mostly old? I think that they're mostly old. I think that there still are stock certificates, but now that we have, uh, you know, we're, we live in the digital age, uh, there, there's not a whole lot of need for them. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to say they're not around because I, I, I truly don't know. But yeah. back, man, back at the turn of the century when corporations started, man, that they are, the, the stock certificates started out very rudimentary and then they became this beautiful thing. And now they're actually things that people collect because some of them are worth a lot of money, you yeah. know? Uh, so I really love to just open up that book on stock certificates or even look, I have this, I have this $5 bill right here, brand new $5 bill. And it's, Abe Lincoln, right? And it, this is all engraved. So I'll just look at and study dollar bills, uh, stock certificates, and I'll really just try to, um, try to come up with new ways and be influenced by the way they create tonal value. Yeah. Because for me, I'm trying to create very, very detailed work because I've always been obsessive about that type of stuff. So and for tonal me- Tonal value yeah. is the key is the key to everything, no matter what your medium is. I, I recently did a video on tonal values. And the more I study it, the more I think about tonal values. I don't care what your medium is, pen and ink, oil paint, 
wood block carving, engraving. It's all about mastering those tonal values. It really is. I'm actually going to be um, teaching a class this Saturday, and it's just an introduction class to printmaking, but that's what most of my class is going to be about. I mean, there's going to be a little bit of practicing with the tools as well, you know, carving, but people... To, people need to get a grasp of tonal values. I mean, that is, especially in printmaking when you're dealing with something that is black and white. I've had this conversation, which is pretty funny, or this debate with people who would walk into my booth and they would say it was just a black and white print, right? Black ink only. And people would ask me like, oh, how many different shades of ink did you have to use for this? And I was like, oh no, it's, it's all black. And uh, I've been in arguments, not arguments, you know, it's not like we got a fight, but I've been in debates with people when they're like, no, and then they get their friend, hey, that's gray, isn't it? That's light gray, right? And you know, oh yeah, it is. Whatever you say, dude, but I'm telling you, the lines are just thinner and it makes it look like it's lighter. Yeah, to right? the eye, yeah. Right, and, and it, it plays a trick on you, especially if you stand away from a distance. But once you look up close to it, it's, I mean, to me, it's obvious because I see it every single day, but some people can't even, can't even tell the, the difference, you know? They, they just think it's a bunch of different uh, tonal values that you actually get out of ink, not from the line work itself. So, okay, that lead, you know what? Share with the audience briefly, basically how you do that. You're, you're, you're literally using a chisel. Ex explain what it is you oh, do. So yeah, I guess I should explain. I never even explained what printmaking really was. Okay, so back to the printmaking history and all that. Uh, the easiest way I explain it to people is you're basically carving a flat surface. I carve wood. A lot of people use linoleum, but I love using uh, wood. So you carve the wood, whatever design you're carving. Once you're done, that block of wood essentially becomes a stamp. And a lot of printmakers don't like explaining it that way or calling them stamps, but it's easier for people to understand that way. Just a so, giant one. So you're, you're creating a big stamp. What you do now when you have that, that carved block of wood is you roll ink on it. The ink that we use is very, very thick. Uh, so it rolls on there and the, whatever you carved, it, you, you, you roll it on there with a, a flat rubber, like a rubber roller. A grayer. Right? Grayer. So everything that you carved out, the ink does not go into it because it's a flat surface and you're rolling it back and forth on there, right? Um, what you do after that is you lay a piece of paper on and either hand burnish the back to transfer the ink or roll it through a printing press. And when you peel the paper off, you get a mirror image of your wood block because that's how you know stamps work. If you've ever seen just a regular stamp. Okay, so let me let me let me go through this and see if I understand it correctly. You're taking a flat piece of wood, and you're carving your image in reverse of what you want it to print, mm -hmm. and you're actually not carving the image. You're carving around the image you want printed. You're you're digging out the negative spaces. And yeah, that's one of the, that's the thing that people need to, uh, to think about the most that plus the reverse thing, you know, if you have any font or anything like that on there, any text, it needs to be backwards on the, on the plate. You call the, the block that you're, you're, you're carving a plate. So, um, where were we going with this? I lost my train of thought. Well, let me, let me redirect a little bit here. So that's pretty mind blowing as it is. Lay on them what reductive carving is and really blow their minds. Okay, so the easiest way I try to explain this, and this is a hard thing to, so color prints can be made one of two ways. You can either, say you have a, an image that you design that has three colors in it. The easy way to, actually, I don't think it's the easy way. It's, it's more work in my opinion, but the first way you learn is you take each individual color and you basically separate it out of the image and you carve that on each individual block. Oh, it's like, uh, like they do for breaking out colors for t-shirt printing. Exactly, so if anybody knows the way silkscreen works, it's kind of like the same way. You have your different screens, they overlap on top of each other and they create a color image. So you're doing that deal with registration of color. 
So that, that's the hard part about, and that's the reason why I don't like that method is because you have to be so precise that every single block has to be the same dimension. You have to make sure the image you transfer on every single block is the same exact size, right? And, um, and then you have to go through the trouble. This is, this is hard either way uh, of printing your first color and then printing your second color on top of that and then making sure it registers correctly. And then obviously the more colors you have, the harder or the, the more you can, the more probability you have of screwing it up. Now, when you have three separate blocks for your, for your image, it's easy to go back and print that. You can print that whole edition whenever you want, again, with any different color, you know, you can change it up. It doesn't really matter. So my method of printing uh, color prints is what's called a reduction woodcut. And it's also called a suicide cut. And I'll tell you. <laughs> so I understand why. So the, crazy. This is the hard one to explain. So let's, let's say we're the same thing, three colors, right? What you want to do is you have your image on there. I draw the whole thing on there, just outline every, my whole image on there, right? With, with marker. Then I'll spray it with uh, like a clear coat because you're going to use the same block to print every single color off of. Okay. So I, I put the clear coat on there. That way, when I take the ink off, I can still see my drawing underneath. Right. So, so you can wipe it. You can, you can do a, your first color and you can wipe that ink off. Right. And you can see then where you need to carve for your next color. Exactly. So you're, you're not having to transfer three separate images, it's all coming off the same exact drawing, right? So you, you eliminate a lot of hassle that way. Uh, so you print on white paper, right? You can print on black, but let's just use this white for an example. So your first, when you're carving out your first color, what you're really basically doing is carving out whatever you want to stay white in your image, okay? So Here's the thing to remember about reduction woodcuts is you have to you have to print your entire edition all at once, and you should probably print more than that because you might lose some through the registration process. Okay, so you carve out all the white, you lay your lightest color down, uh, and there's a reason for this. You want to lay your lightest color down because say uh, it's yellow, and then you're printing blue next, right? the blue is going to lay right on top of the yellow and it's going to look just fine. Now, if you did the blue first and the yellow next, then you would be able to see that blue through the yellow because uh, it's a little, it's more translucent, you know, and you know a lot about this because you, you, you paint, right? Now, there's really cool techniques where you actually take this into consideration and you create different, even more, to more values by adding uh, an extender to make colors more uh, translucent. That way oh. the color actually shows through and, it, and you can actually get it. There's a lot of really creative printmakers out there that can, that are masters at this. It's really cool. But going back to this, you print, say I'm gonna print 10 prints just to keep it easy. I'll probably do my yellow color first and print 15 sheets, right? What I'll do next is I'll wipe the, bla the, the plate off and then carve out whatever I want to stay yellow, okay? Because in this stage, I'm gonna be layering something on top of the yellow. Let's just say the a blue, for example. Uh, so whatever I carve out, when I lay my blue on there and reprint the same, the same sheets that I had just printed, then that yellow will show through on whatever I carved. Right. Are you, are you following here? Yes. Okay. And you always print, or I always print, black is your last color because it's the, it, you know, it's the darkest, it, it can cover anything. So your final color, uh, you go through and you carve it, and then you, you layer that on top of all your other prints. So like I said before, it's called a reduction woodcut because every step of the way, you're reducing the block even more. And because of the process, you can never go back and print any of your previous colors, okay? And like I said before too, it's called a suicide cut as well because if you screw this process up on your last color, oh. then you've ruined your whole edition and there's no reversing it because it's not like you can go back and start over, right?
So it's a perfect art form for somebody who loves attention to detail. Yes, it, it, I would say so. There, man, there's some, uh, there's some awesome artists out there that do reduction woodcuts. It's really not my specialty at all. I really like single colors, but I, I do love doing them because they are, they are just so fun to do. I love single color work also, because if you can make something work in one color, you've, you've nailed it. And then color is just icing on the cake. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what is your favorite ground to work on? So I started off um, carving linoleum like a lot of people do because it's, e it's the easiest thing. They have easier things now to learn on, but I don't ever recommend it because then you can never really, once you start using things that are so easy to carve on, then you almost don't ever want to progress and do something that, that's a little more challenging. Right. Uh, yeah. So once I got just comfortable at carving and I kind of realized how to move the tool around, what to do, what not to do, I started carving on wood exclusively because that's traditionally the way it was done. Now, the, the type of wood I choose is really depending, is dependent on what project I'm doing. So I recently got done with a, uh, a big Miles Davis piece. Gorgeous. And I've seen it. It is huge. It's um, it's almost five feet wide. It's about three feet tall. And yeah. it took me, I swear, it took me. I don't know. It was like over eight hundred hours to carve. Right. Wow. Uh, that whole block of wood, their planks of wood, it's basswood. Now basswood is awesome because I think it's actually considered a hardwood, even though you can actually nick it with your finger. Yeah, it's really not as soft as balsa, but. Right, but, but I like it because the grain is very, very, very tight. It's wow. not spread out. So when you sand it, you can get like a very consistent, uh, you don't see any grain in it at all. And when you're carving it, you don't have to worry about hard spots in the wood at all, which is like, if you carve, I actually started carving poplar first. And poplar is pretty easy to carve, but it has some, some, some spots in it, some areas that are just really hard. So what'll happen is if you have an inconsistent piece of wood like that, is you're carving a line and you're adding more pressure in those hard spots, but there might be a soft spot right, right behind it. Ooh. So what can happen a lot is you're pushing hard and then all of a sudden you, you go like this because you know, there's a soft spot right there. And oh, uh, printmaking is, man, a lot of printmaking or wood, woodcuts are really about improvisation because you have to learn how to fix mistakes like that. And make it not look like a mistake. And make it not look like a mistake. So if I'm working on a bigger project, I love using basswood uh, because it's not it's effortless to carve because I keep my tools extremely sharp. Um, it's harder than linoleum, though. I don't. I think linoleum is harder to carve. the The problem that people run into with basswood is you need to keep your tools extremely sharp, and I have. I invested in a very expensive sharpener. I still have to hand sharpen it myself and it's still a art. There's an art to it. Like you have to really practice and learn what the heck you're doing. You, you did could, a video on sharpening, didn't you? Yeah, and it's about, I think it's about a 20 minute video. And yeah. it, you know, you gotta, you gotta learn angles. Uh, you, you have to learn exactly how, when to stop, car, when to stop um, sharpening it and when to start honing it. Like you need to learn all these different things it really is a craft in itself to learn how to sharp, sharpen tools. See, so, this is the minutia that I love of mastering a medium. Because like I know from talking to you that not only have you had to master the art form, but like you say, the craft part. I always say the art is in the head, the craft is in the hands. You had to master the craft part. So the sharpening, the, invest, the monetary investment in equipment for sharpening. I know for a fact you have a wood shop in your garage where you build your planks that you work on. Um, so you've had to master things that most artists would, wouldn't really think about, like, like woodworking, um, how to dowel together and, and plane flat a, a, a ground to carve out of. Um, literally, how to sharpen your, your gouges and your, and your chisels. It's, you know, I love that minutia. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, oh, I think yeah. people need to, uh, it's the minutia of being an artist is kind of why I started this channel. It, it's the little stuff that nobody tells you in art school. Like, 
learn to draw the figure, learn the cylinders and cylinders and blocks and, and, and spheres, you, you know, but the minutia of you having to learn to, to sharpen and stuff, that's fascinating to me. And I hope it's fascinating to other artists. Well, look, it's, uh, I knew that, look, I try to make every new piece I work on, I strive to make it better than the last one. And I, it, I came to a point where I realized that in order for my artwork to get better, I had to, I had to learn how to keep my tool sharp and how to sharpen them much better than I was doing. Um, and luckily for me, I am a super tool nerd. Like I just love equi shop equipment. Uh, I love welders and, and automotive tools and woodworking tools. So I've accumulated a lot of nice tools over the years. Um, and so for me, it was an easy like, oh, hey, I get to buy another tool. It, I get to buy this sweet sharpener, you know, that's going to help my business and going to help me uh, succeed in the goals I'm trying to accomplish. Um, does, does, let me, if you don't mind me interrupting, but does, do you suggest to someone just starting out in this to invest in the expensive, you know, carving tools and the sharpener and everything? Or no. can they, okay, let, take off with that. Let me. No, not at all. And because um, I, you know, this is something that you have to kind of learn and really find out for yourself if you're going to be into it or not. I mean, I know it looks really interesting and cool to people, uh, but it, it is, uh, it's a lot of work and it takes a lot of different uh, muscles in your, in your brain to kind of think about the difference of that negative, you know, working in the negative, uh, learning how to use the tool properly. So I always recommend to people, buy linoleum, it's cheap, and buy yourself just a, uh, a, a beginner set of carving tools, you know, because you don't want to spend a whole lot of money on something that you're not going to, you're not going to use. Right. Uh, so, and then I tell people, look, it, it, if at that point you like it and you want to, you want to get better at it, then start investing into some better tools, some better paper, some better ink, because all of these things progress. And um, if you're doing the type of work that I do, uh, I have to have the best Japanese rice paper because, uh, you know, it will not do it justice to use a lower quality paper for the prints that I produce, you know, and I have to have the best tools because it really does make a difference in my work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. I, uh, just to kind of backtrack a little bit about the ground, I know you were doing a very small series of blues men that you were carving on. Was it uh, end grain maple? Yeah. So actually I forgot to go into that. So, like I said before, the wood that I select is really dependent on the project. Yeah. So I have, and actually, let me grab this. I think I have them right here somewhere. Not that the, you'll be able to, the lighting is so. I love those pieces. That, and you did a Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yeah. So if you see how small this thing is, yeah. it's tiny, right? It's about two inches tall. But the detail in this thing is insane because when you carve on a very, very hard surface, like end grain maple, maple like a butcher block, um, that, that grain is so tight and so hard that you can actually just scribe it with a razor. And as long as you don't put too much ink on it, when you go to print it, you can see those razor scrapes in it. Like it is really, really awesome the amount of detail you can get with these things. Um, what, that's actually called a wood engraving. I keep my tools sharp enough that I can use my regular wood carving, my regular woodcut tools for it, in addition to the different uh, wood engraving tools, which look more like different size knives, different thicknesses. Um, so if I'm doing something real small, I'll use end grain maple because I know I can get just, I can get details like you see in a dollar bill, you know? Now, Maybe are not. you still carving that? by removing the negative space? Or are you doing it like an etching where you carve the line in and fill the line with ink and wipe it off the surface? No, that's a different type of, that, that, that is like etching, right? No, I'm still doing it exactly the way I do uh, the, my relief prints. Gotcha. I'm also working on a piece right now that I'm hopefully, man, I've been working on this thing forever, uh, but I'm hoping to get it done by this Friday. I'm hoping to print it. And it's, it's also carved on maple, but it's not end grain because it's a little bit bigger. It's, uh, 
You won't be able to see it, but at least you'll be able to see the size. So this piece here is about 11 inches wide. A little closer, please. Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, yeah, I've been watching the progress online of this. This is the one that's been influenced by the uh, uh, certificate engraving, correct? Yeah, yeah. So this one is on hard maple, but it's the long grain. So uh, it, it's easier to carve than the end grain. But the reason, one of the reasons I need a harder wood for this is because I knew that I just wanted to go crazy with the detail in this piece. And if you're using a soft wood, you know, after you, after you do a few passes under the, the printing press because of the pressure, or even if you're hand burnishing it, basswood, you know, if you have real tiny little details in there, whenever it gets pressed, it'll smash it down just a tiny bit, right? Just yeah. a hair. So every print that comes off of it, every additional print, starts to look the integrity of the of the lines starts to diminish with every pass right uh, so with uh with a harder wood like hard maple which is just great to carve on because of the tight consistency uh it, it all feels the same when you're carving it, it, it it's going to act more like that end grain maple where you can you can you can print hundreds of these things out and uh, with the line work that i do it's tiny which it's all about how you ink it too. You have to be so careful with all this stuff because if you put too much ink on it, it's gonna fill those tiny little hairlines with ink and then they won't print, right? So as long as you're very careful with all this stuff, you can get some pretty crazy detail. Now, do you have to, um, how do you handle your ink? Can you, I assume you can use it right out of the jar, but when you're doing something delicate like that, do you thin it? Is there, do, uh, can you thin printing ink? I don't know anything. I'm, I've never done any printing like this. Well, since I was, you know, in high school or something, I did some linoleum, but can, do you have to manipulate your inks? So a couple things. So with, with this piece, I actually have a, before I get to the ink part. Um, so I have a few of these brayers. I have a lot of brayers. Uh, this is like the regular type I use for the most part. It's a soft brayer, like you can actually squeeze it, right? And it has a lot of give. Since this piece has so much um, detail in it, I have a hard brayer, which is pretty damn hard. It's very, very dense. So that's what I'm going to use to roll the ink on here. Because if, if you think about it, the softer the brayer is, the more likely it is to kind of compress and get into those lines a little bit more, right? Yes. So using a hard brayer helps. I know that you can add, I forget what it is. You can add something to your ink. <laughs> to like make, an extender? It's not an extender. It actually makes it, uh, it, it makes your ink a little bit um, harder or something oh. like that. So um, I don't ever use it though, because I, I take such special care to the way, like it takes me forever to ink a block because I do it sections at a time. I know where some sections needs a little, need a little bit more ink. So I'll, I'll be a little bit more careful there, adding a little bit more ink. But the, some of the sections, like the background of this piece, they have like little pin hair, like dots. And I know when I go over that area, it's gonna take maybe a couple passes with my brayer. Yeah. And then I, I should probably avoid rolling ink on it anymore. Doesn't that wood absorb the ink? Like, it's, doesn't it suck into the pores or? It does. So what I do with all my pieces, the reason why this is red is for a, few, for a couple of reasons, is because when I carve into it, I want to actually see what I'm doing. If I were to keep it the same color and I carve into it, well, then all you're seeing is wood print, right? Right. With the red, it contrasts the, um, the carving lines. So did you draw your image on there first or transfer it with tracing paper or somehow you do it and then tone it with the red? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go through it real quick. Uh, I prep my wood so it's nice and flat. Then I will actually take some paint, some like latex paint, and I will brush it on nice and thin. And then I'll, I'll rub the, the paint into the pores of the wood. Oh, kind of sealing it a little? And that starts to fill in the, just the tiny little, uh, the tiny little pores of the wood, it starts to seal it. Now, after I'm done with that, then I'll go ahead and draw my image on. And then 
once that's done, I'll ink it with, you know, with a, a micron pen. And then I'll spray it with a translucent paint. The reason I spray it with that translucent paint is because it's easier for me to see the wood grain in it. Yeah. Uh, because you kind of have to think about that when you're carving it. And it also, uh, there's some areas that I don't draw over them with a micron pen because I just want to get to carving right away. Yeah, so I can, you're putting in what you need and you know where you're going with the rest of it. Yeah, so I can still basically see my pencil marks, Yeah. right? Uh, in addition to the, that translucent paint providing that contrast, it also starts to seal the pores of the wood even more. Right. Now, when you go to print it, the first print typically takes, I'll, 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 I'll typically roll a nice thin layer of ink on the whole thing and then I'll, I'll do that a few times and print it and it'll be a real, real light print. They're not usable, they're just artist proofs. But that on its own with the compression of the, of the printing press starts to seal the wood. And once, I'm, once I've done with that whole process, I will start actually printing my, my, my true edition. It's almost like you have to season it. Exactly, yeah, yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah, it's a lot of, there's a lot of different things that go into it. You don't have to do any of these things, but I have to do it to get the amount of detail to print and to and for it to to stay nice and clean the way I want it to. Right now, <clears throat> this is going to sound silly, but there's a lot of artists out there that can't draw. And can you walk us through? I know you can draw. Walk. Can you walk us through your process from idea sketch to to like, like, do you use a computer in your design phase of your work? Do, how much, you know, I get, I, I guess I'm trying to get to, there are skills, people want to jump right in on the wood block, but there are other skills that come into play before you get to actual carving and printing. And that's drawing, uh, researching, shooting mm -hmm. reference, um, can you talk a little bit about your process there? Yeah, I'll, I'll use um, I'll use this for an example because this has been. I think I've had more fun with this uh, than I think any project I've ever done because of the amount of research. So let me start from the beginning. I'm a very I can visualize things in my head very easily, and it's really annoying to my wife because I'll try to explain things to her, and she just you know she's like just draw it out you know she she has to see it right. You're preaching well, to the choir, my friend. I um, I have thoughts all the time. I have ideas all the time, and I can see them in my head. Now, what I do with that is, with this piece, for example, I just sketched out very quickly after doing a bunch of research and knowing what elements I wanted in this piece, because they are a ton of elements. They're all very symbolic. Uh, I write all of my elements down on a list. Yeah. Yeah. I actually... And I number them from importance, which ones need to be more like, you know, in your face and, wow. you know, so after I do that, then I'll go ahead and start sketching out just a very, the very basic figure. Cause she, she's the focal point in this piece and start putting the things around her. Uh, now back in the day, and, and I, I'm lucky because, you know, I've been an artist my whole life, so I do know how to draw. Uh, but back in the day, I had to do all this just, you know, the hard way, you know, not using a computer. Right. With, for example, I knew exactly what my concept was going to look like because I, I, I just very rudimentarily just drew all my things in there. Like kind of, thumbnailed it? Yep, thumbnailed it. Uh, a bunch of thumbnails. That's, a, that's, a, that's actually something you have gotten me to do is work with thumbnails because it's, it's easy when you're, when you're working with something like this that has so many components to it, there's things that I actually took out of it uh, because they wouldn't work. Yeah. You know? And there's things I was able to add into it because it did work. So being able to come up with the several little sketches uh, of concept drawings, and then after that, uh, doing shooting my reference. Yeah. So getting my model, shooting the picture of her, and um, then looking up a lot of, you know, it was winter time. So it's, you know, you can't go out and, and find a whole, like every reference shot that you need. Right. You know, 
So just going through the internet, looking at hundreds or thousands of photos of different things that I need, and then picking the ones that will look the best or, or, the, or be like this eagle, for example, that's in here. Uh, I had to look, I looked at eagles for days until I finally found the one. I'm like, oh shoot, that's the one that's going to work. Cause I knew he was going to have a banner sticking out of his mouth and he had to be pointed a, a specific way. Right. He had to look like naturally sitting next to this lady here. Right. Right. So um, I use an, an illustrator type uh, uh, program called affinity and I just, I, I took my, my basic photograph of the model, put her in there, and then I started adding these different elements around it uh, and, and just kind of pasting them there and moving them around and- Playing with scale and- Yeah, playing with scale and all that, playing with that, you know? Yep. Like I said before, you'd have to do this all by hand and it, it, it just takes so much time. And look, me and you, we can do things like that because we practiced it our whole lives. Yep. Uh, doing that now for me doesn't make sense because it would take me, it would take me a month to get this thing even to the point where I can carve it. Yeah. Even with the tools I have now, it still takes me two or three. It, I think it still took me two or three weeks to do this thing. Yeah. You know? So after I have my whole concept laid out in that uh, illustrator, then I will then take that piece and I'll reverse it, right? The only thing I'll transfer, the only thing I'll trace onto a woodblock is text. So this one says, in God we trust, 1776, e pluribus, and I'm like, it has all this text in it, right? That stuff I had to actually print out and use carbon paper because it's all backwards and I'm not gonna deal with it. Perfect or it'll look, it'll look dumb. And I want it, to, I want the text to look, look absolutely perfect right yeah. everything else though i'll i like to just practice illustrating still so i'll just sit there with my reference photo and, and draw it directly onto the piece of the pencil um once i have it laid out the way i want to then i'll use that micron pen for my the real lines that i'm going to be going off of can i ask you your opinion on the controversy of tracing things down I've recently seen some things on the internet where people were saying that if you, if you trace a, a photograph down and then paint it or carve it or draw it or whatever, that you've somehow cheated. What, what is your opinion on that? Huh. I feel like I had a strong opinion about that before I became a professional artist. Um, because I guess in a way you could call it cheating, right? Because you, you haven't, um, you haven't done it completely by hand or, or done it completely yourself from start to finish. Now, because I have, because I, I had that thought in the past, um, that's why I still pay, pay special attention to keeping up my drawing skills and, and really practicing them when it comes time to do it because the last thing I want to do is, is for my own, uh, for myself, I don't want to feel like a fraud. And I'm not, and I don't even want to say that anybody who does that is a fraud. Uh, it, it's a lot more nuanced, nuanced than that. So to be honest with you, I think that if this is all your, if, if this is, if you're copying like from start to finish and, and it's that, there's a lot of originality and um, I, I, I don't, I personally am not fond of that. Now, if this is the way you, you put, you know, food on the table for your kids, for your family, this is your way to survive. I mean, if you have integrity as an artist, uh, I, I, I am more okay with it. I feel like I have more integrity. I don't, you know, I use the computer for some things, but I do not rely on it. And I still keep up on, like I said, practicing, drawing, illustrating, all that stuff. In my opinion, that's the key. It's, are you tracing it because you can't draw it? Or are you tracing it because of time? You know, maybe you have a deadline you have to meet. Um, you know, our, our, our mutual friend, Tom Fritz, and I were talking one time, we were talking about this and 
And I really liked his opinion. He said, art doesn't care how it gets created. But what you said about personal artistic integrity, to me, the key is, is are you, are you tracing it because you can't draw it? Or are you tracing it because it's expedient? I don't have a problem with tracing for expediency as long as you can draw it. it I know that's splitting hairs, but I think people, young, especially young artists, can fall into a trap where they're tracing everything and they're not working on those basic skills, those basic drawing skills. That's just my, you know, personal opinion. And we all know those are like a-holes. Everybody's got them and most of them stay. Well, and look, I, I, I agree with you, but I really do think it's a personal, it's an opinion, right? Yeah. Um, like Tom said, art doesn't care how it's created, uh, but that's something you're going to have to decide for yourself. You know, if you're okay with that, then there's not an art God that's going to strike you down in the afterlife because you trace something, you know, that's right. if, if people are finding value in your work, if you're selling stuff, if you're, if you're creating beautiful things, beautiful or not, it doesn't even matter. Each individual, they have their own, they, they are free to do what they want. I, I do not agree with people who um, will tell you that it's otherwise because they have a different opinion about it. You can have your own opinion, but it doesn't mean that you're right. Yeah. And, you know, I, I see through history, if you read art history, there's a lot of uh, rules, you know, like if you went back, to, went, to, went back to classical times, there were certain rules about art, you know, and then some artist comes along and breaks those rules and creates something really amazing and changes the rules. And it's yeah. like, I've recently been seeing a lot of, uh, you know, the, the five, the five design rules or the five rules of design and all this stuff, other stuff. And I'm like, I look at this stuff and I go, this is a bunch of hogwash. You know, to me, and maybe I'm the one full of hogwash, but design is, does it, does, do the parts work? Does it feel right? Forget about like the golden ratio and all of this weird trying to dissect. I, I, I don't know. It just, the bottom line is, is when you make a piece, does it move someone? Exactly. Like, you, you know, if you're pointing at a piece and saying, well, this isn't balanced, this, this is arbitrarily not good now because the rules of design say so. Right. That's a bunch arbitrarily of not good. Right. That, that is, that is arbitrary and it's nonsense because I see a bunch of art that I believe is nonsense that sells for way more than I could ever imagine making. Right. Doesn't mean that, um, you know, that I'm right about the way I feel about it. You know, because other people obviously feel differently about it. And who's to say, who are you to say that you need to follow these rules when there's been examples throughout history of people breaking those rules and creating beautiful works of art? Right. Right. Well, all right. You know what? I've, I've covered a lot of the questions that I wanted to uh, wanted you to talk about, but I'm going to hit you with some real quick. What's the one thing you wish you had known when you began your career? Hmm. Man, there's so many. <laughs> um, I wish I would have known that if I believed in myself more and I didn't strictly just think about my skill, that it would have, it would have led me in a different path. And look, I, I, I really... This is a funny question because um, everything in my life has happened, I think, the way it should have. And I learned a lot from it. So if I'm being truly honest with you, everything worked out the way it did because it had to. You right know, and I'm the artist I am now because of it. Right on. What are, what are some of the most valuable traits a person wanting a career in the arts needs? One, one or two valuable traits. I think the most important traits are discipline and persistence. And persistence and like hard work are the, basically the, you know, I can lump those into the same category. Um, those seem to go kind of against the stereotype of the classic artist. 
you know, you're, you're moved by your passion and inspiration. Man, that is a trap that nobody should believe or fall into, in my opinion. Right. Because if you're relying on inspiration and, and that is your way of creating work, then you've got to figure something else out, my friend, because uh, I rely on discipline because that way I know at least that way I'll create things every single day and I'll, I'll be regimented. And um, look, if you don't, if, if, if you don't need to make money on this thing, then you can follow whatever rules you want. Right. Yeah. But if this is something you actually want to be successful and make money at, uh, you have got to have a work ethic and you have got to be persistent. I so mean, you I, treat, you treat I, being an artist like it's a regular job. I, I absolutely, I treat an artist as being an entrepreneur, to be honest with you, because it's more about if you're going to be an artist full time, it's probably because you already have the passion for it, right? Yeah. Now, it's your job to figure out how the hell to run a business and how the heck to sell these things. You know, that is the hard part. You know, you creating work. That's honestly one of the easier things about being an artist. Uh, you, you getting your name out there, uh, putting in all the hours, traveling, problem solving. That is what people need to think about if they're truly, if they truly want to be an artist full time. Because yeah, this problem is solving. This Dude, is I, will never, I will never forget the first time you and I met, I believe it was in Detroit. You had driven all the way from Colorado with a stack of wall panels on the roof of your little compact car through snowstorms. You, I remember you had them like strapped to the roof, bungeed with like um, tarps over them to keep them from getting soaked in the snow and the sleet. But you, told, you, you solved that problem. You're like, I got to do this show in Detroit and I need these panels to hang my art on. How am I going to get them there? I can't, just, I can't just add water when I get there and have them pop up. I got to strap these things to my car. So you solved that problem, which was a big problem. Those were big pants. They were as big as the car, if I remember right. They, they were. And you know what? That's, yeah, I bought a ski rack, not for skis. I bought a ski rack for the sole purpose of putting my art panels on it. Yeah. You know? And it's crazy when I look back on those times now, because I was crazy. I wanted it so bad. I wanted so bad to succeed and to sell my artwork and to get my name out there. That I didn't care what it took. But you I gotta drove, do that. You I know, that that you have to do that. Absolutely, but that's how bad you have to want things if you know if you want it to work out. Yeah, you know, I could have given it a half-ass effort and complained about it and maybe given up because of it, but failure was never going to be an option for me ever. I knew that I had to make it work out, and I also knew that you know the first few years of this thing was going to be hard, and that I was going to have to travel around. So it's funny because now I look back on it and I'm like, holy crap, you were a crazy person back then. Like you were so cra like I, and, and, and while I was in the moment, while I was doing it, it was no big deal. I was like, Shh, this is what I got to do. When's yeah. the next show? You know? Yeah. I think sometimes like when, when you and I would go and set up at different shows, I think it hits you when you finally got all the crap out of the van or whatever. And you're like, holy cow, I bring a lot of stuff. You know? no, and, and, and look, I would bring framed artwork everywhere. I've had, I've, I've had broken glass that I've had to repair hundreds I, of dollars of lost frames from banging them up, moving them. And yeah. And then, you know, you finally end up coming up with some sort of system. Yeah. Uh, but you just have to want it like bad. You have to basically want it as much as you want to breathe. You want, you, you, you have to work so hard at it if you want it to succeed. And going back to your other, your other question, your first question, man, if you don't have that in you, and if you don't want it that bad, this is not for you. <laughs> no, no, because you will work harder doing this than at any job you ever had. Oh, look, I could have stayed at, in the military making a great paycheck and uh, having great benefits, but I did not, I, I couldn't do it anymore, man. Like no. I, I left it and, and this is 10 times, this is 100 times harder than that job ever was. But I am also a hundred times happier because of it too. And it's taught me so much. And I've met so many people along the way. I've been able to travel internationally on other people's dime. Uh, you know, we've both been able to do this stuff because we chose to stick to it and we were serious about it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And you know, the other thing that I love is you have three small children. I love the example you're setting for them about going after what you're supposed to be doing with your life, you know, and you don't let stuff get in your way. Of course, life does get in the way. You do have three small children. You do have a wife that needs your attention. You do have responsibilities outside of being an artist like everybody does. But I think a lot of times people don't think of being an artist as being a small business owner or an entrepreneur, which is essentially what you are. Um, so while I'm pontificating about that, let me ask you this. How much of what you do is being an artist and how much of it is running a business? I feel like at the point I'm at now, um, it's, all, it's about 50-50. Uh, when I first started out, it was mainly figuring out how to run my business. Yeah. Now that I have that figured out, um, I can spend a lot more attention and care to what I'm doing. And because I have been able to succeed uh, in, in what I'm doing, it's given me more time to create things like the one I'm working on now or the Miles Davis, where, look, I can spend months and months and months on one piece of art. And I have my business set up to where I still make sales every day on my website because of all the work I put in before. Yeah. Right. And I'm still being active on social media. I'm talking to people, uh, you know, uh, business is intertwined into all of it still very, very much so, but it's what? not as hard anymore because. No, you're an artist, man. You, you, no way, man. If people think that they are out of their mind. If, if they think being an artist is just about creating art, you will. And if that's the thought you have going into it, man, you, you have something else coming. And, unless you just have money that you can just play with for the rest of your life. I yeah. mean, come on. But I, I think a lot of times people like the kind of stereotypical image of being an artist. As an outsider, you see the world differently, this kind of thing, which, you know, in some aspects, maybe that is true. But in other aspects, we're business people. You know, yeah. when you come down, we just happen to create our own product. How many artists have you met who are super awkward and you know that it affects their business because they cannot interact with people, yeah. right? It's such a, if you're going to be an artist, you have to be a one man wedding band who knows, who has skills in social relations who has skills in business, who has skills in, in their actual craft, you have to be able to do it all. And, you know, the goal is to, at some point, be able to let that stuff be run by somebody else, right? And have you only worry about the creative side of things. That is the end goal. Um, but you can't, you can't start off that way. You have to learn how to do all this other stuff first. Yeah, and it all takes time. Nothing happens overnight. Oh, hell no. <laughs> so even people who may have just discovered you or even me, to, to, to them, we're new. But you and I have both been at it. Well, we've been artists our whole lives. But me personally, I've been doing the fine art thing since 2007. And I think you came a little bit after that. But a decade virtually, right? Yeah. 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 Right on, man. So I got a few more. This is, we're going to do this part for fun. This, I'm going to call this the speed round. Okay. And I'm going to hit you with some either or questions. You just answer the first thing that comes into your head and we'll boogie right through these. I got 20 questions. Ready? Okay. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Black or white? Black and white or color? Black and white. Drawings or paintings? Drawings. Books or movies? Books. Chocolate or vanilla? Vanilla. Hunting or fishing? Hunting. Winter or summer? Summer. Rural or urban? Man, this is our one. <laughs> Gosh, I got, oh, urban. Cake or pie? Cake. Really? <laughs> Comedy or mystery? Mystery. Dancing or singing? Singing. Board games or video games? Board games. Crushed ice or cubed ice? Cubed, my friend, all day long. Or the little, the big balls you put in the rock glass with your whiskey. Yeah, screw that shaved ice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Unless you're making tiki drinks, then you want that great yeah. shot. Nice. Very, well, I'm, I'm like a, well, me and you are both this way, but I'm like a whiskey cocktail snob. And yeah. so I'm very particular about, I hate the ice that comes out of my, my refrigerator yeah. because it, because of the water here, it's hard. So the ice is super cloudy. So I actually go to the gas station and buy nice ice and I dump it in my freezer at the bottom. That wow. way you put it in and it's nice and crystal clear when you put it in the mixed drink. My, uh, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law blessed us with a, an ice maker for our bar. Oh, yeah, I'm going to get one of those. It's great. We just use bottled water in it. It's delicious. Sweet. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, antique or brand new? Antique. Cowboys or aliens? Cowboys. Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Trek. <laughs> money <laughs> or fame? Did you say money or fame? Yeah. Money. Washing dishes or doing laundry? Doing laundry. Hardwood or carpet? Hardwood. Picnic or nice restaurant? Ooh, nice restaurant. That is my speed round for the day, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Only got cut up on a couple of those. <laughs> yeah, that's fun though. That's really that's a that's a really fun little exercise. Well, um, share with everyone where they can find you on the internet. I'll also put those links down below. Um, uh, when we post this video. So share with everyone where they can find you. Yeah. Oldschoolalex.com is the easiest way. From there, you can just click on my Instagram, which is the real old school Alex. I also have a YouTube channel. Um, that is everything's found on my website, though. If you just go to it, you can scroll down to the bottom of any page and it'll have little icons for Facebook, Instagram, all that stuff. Oldschoolalex.com. Right on. Now, you know what? That leads me to a side question. Why did you choose to use something like old school Alex rather than just your name? You know, what's funny is I actually am not a, I'm not a super fan of that name anymore, but it, it's just what people know me as now. So I, I just have decided to kind of keep it. Yeah. Um, I don't really, I, I don't have a good answer for this one. I think because I was so into, I still am into the hot rod culture uh, uh, I don't know. Everybody has some sort of like nickname, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, um, it, it's just something that speaks to what really what I'm about. So I, I can't say that I'm completely upset with it because if you know me, like, look, my house was built in 1886. That's I, old love, school. <laughs> I love old things. I love old vehicles. I love restoring my house. Yeah. I love old ways of living. I love old fashion values, uh, everything about me is like my grandparents, you know, like I, I do love some new things, of course, as well, but uh, old school is me. That, that, that's what I'm all about. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. I'm, I'm similar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could you tell? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, well, Alex, thank you so much for uh, coming on today. I think, I think you gave a real nice over, you know, overview of what it is you do. Um, I'm personally fascinated by it and uh, I'm really happy to have been able to share that with the people watching my video here. So thank you. Oh, brother, anytime and um, I, I love talking to you. I, I think this is another thing that people need to, need to know is me and you have been talking like this forever. Yeah. See, we, we yeah, it's like, it's like a swim buddy for the art world. Yeah. And we help each other out. We talk to each other about ideas and, you know, this is a hard thing we're doing. Uh, so it's, it's good to have a friend to, uh, to bounce ideas off of to, to talk through things, uh, whether it's art or not. I totally second that. And I want to encourage people find someone that they respect their work that they can keep as, as an art buddy. I don't know what a better way phrase to use, but art buddy, because like, as an example, in the last month, you and I, I got a phone call from you, and then you got a phone call from me, and both of those phone calls were bouncing ideas off of each other. What do you think if I was to do this? Or does this sound right? Does this work? You know, you, you, after you've stared at something or thought about something for so long, you can't be objective about it anymore. And to have another creative person that you respect in your corner going, yeah, do that, or no, don't do that, or do it this way, maybe. It's and it really right. has to be, it, it really, for your benefit, needs to be somebody who's going to push you and yeah. who, um, you know, who has good habits. 
Yeah. Because the last thing you want is to surround yourself with people. And I think this is a general life rule people should follow is don't surround yourself with people who are going to be negative and who aren't going to help you, who aren't willing to help you. you yeah. Know? Surround yourself with people who are going to push you and people who are high achievers, people you want to learn from, you know? Well, I hope you're getting value out of these videos. And if you are, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and don't forget to hit that bell so you don't miss any of my upcoming videos. Now, I want to take a minute and thank Alex Carmona once again for joining me for this very informative interview. I know I learned a lot. I hope you learned a lot. Don't forget to look him up online, find his work. So until next time, go make something cool. Owen's out.